everyone, and welcome to another episode of Bulletproof Hygiene. We hope you are having a fantastic week, and this week we're excited to have a little fun with physics. Now, before you turn this off because you think, oh my gosh, physics and I aren't best friends, you need to know that physics aren't really Brittany and my best friends either. Neither one of us were physics majors. Uh, we don't love math either, just so you know. Shocker. Um, <laughs> Shocker. Yeah, if you just got anxiety when Teresa said physics, you're in good company. Don't worry. Yeah. Yes. Please don't turn it off yet. Just wait. Um, it, it'll be worth your while. Yes. We're taking this in a, a completely unexpected direction here. However, it's very important, very important topic. So we're going down this road today. Yes. So fun with physics. Who knew that could be a thing? Yeah. It sounds so, like an oxymoron. Those things right? are usually mutually exclusive. Yeah. So just to kind of kick it off, I want to talk a little bit about the laws, what the laws of physics are. So basically the laws of physics are statements based on repeated experiments or observations that describe or predict a range of natural phenomena. And so, for example, we have, um, or, or one of the, the overarching laws is the law of relativity. And this was um, created by Albert Einstein. And it basically says that the laws of physics are the same for all inertial reference frames, meaning all the laws of physics apply equally to everyone in all situations. So Brittany and I thought today, like what, how cool would it be if we kind of look at some of the laws of physics out there and kind of look at how that applies to us in our hygiene roles and in our hygiene world. So let's start with one of the most well-known laws, which is the laws of uni the law of universal gravitation. Basic, basically, this is Isaac Newton's law of gravity. So this states that an object attracts another object in direct proportion to their combined mass and inversely related to the square of the distance between them. Sorry, what? That doesn't sound like basic gravity to me. Can you please explain for the layman people, for the lay people out here, can, can you translate that just so that I feel better about what you just said? So probably, I probably can't do a great job of it. I mean, I'm not a <laughs> physics major, but... Uh, I'm going to dumb it down to say that if we drop our scalar, it's going to hit the floor okay. because that scalar has a mass that when you combine with the distance and the relation of the two, it's going to pull that down. Got it. Okay. Drop right. scalar hits the floor because we're on earth. It'd be different if we were on the moon type of thing. Correct. Okay. Got it. Gra Gravity 101. Okay. Got gotcha. It. But what I really want to roll this into is so in hygiene. Our, our number one focus is obviously attracting patients to our practice, right? So we're talking about the law of attraction here and how that depends on the mass and the distance between them. So obviously I'm not getting into patient's mass as far as patient size goes, because that's not really what we're going for here. But we do have to consider the size of what all our patients bring in to us every day and the weight of that. You know, patients have a whole lot going on in their lives. And so it could be their lifestyle habits, um, you know, what's going on in their lives, the stresses they're facing, you know, are they, are they going through a divorce? Did they just lose a job? Um, did they get a, a diagnosis? What does that health history look like? Right. Um, you know, genetics, how are they wired? So I just feel like there's so much that patients bring in that we have to consider that that is a really important part of us being able to connect with them and, and be attractive to them as, as, and I don't mean physically attractive, but I mean attractive as, hey, this is a place that really understands me and connects with me and can get me healthy. Right. Yeah. And that does. So, so I see what you're saying. So in regards to like the gravitational pull type of thing, like it, even as it relates to perio is what I'm thinking, just like patients come in with all their stuff, depending on how much mass and the weight of what they are bringing to the practice today um, kind of determines what they're going to look like on the spectrum of health and how far, you know, disease is active or their disease, their health or disease status has quote unquote fallen, if you will, you know what I mean? It does impact that directly. Right. So that's interesting. So just in that way, even in like a mechanical, like thinking, what are you bringing in the door? How has it impacted your body since the last time I saw you? How has it impacted your perio health? That makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. And we have to consider too, like, I think the lifestyle factors is a big part of it because we don't always think about that. You know, obviously we're asking the patients, Hey, have you had any medical changes, any, you know, new diagnosis, new medications, any new doctor's findings? You know, how about dentally? Anything? No, you know, you notice that it's been sensitive or sorty, or are you seeing bleeding? But what we don't always ask about are, you know, lifestyle changes, you know, have, have you quit smoking? 
Have you had a big job change and it's super stressful and now you're really under the gun? Um, you know, now you're not sleeping well at night. You know, there's just so many things that we don't necessarily think about. And obviously, you know, patients aren't always forthcoming on that kind of stuff. You know, people don't really just open up and, you know, spill all the hard things, but those are important things for us to consider as we are trying to really take the best care of our patients and connect with them. Right. Yeah. And things like, you know, I think about, you know, even the periphery of someone, you know, changing a job and maybe like their, you know, maybe their new job is stressful one, because it's new um, or two, because it's actually a more stressful job. Maybe they got a promotion, like there's that aspect, but then there's also like the commute aspect. Did you have to move because of that job change? You know, did, did you encounter a move in that period of time? Was there a point in time where you weren't or you're maybe neglecting your physical health a little bit because you had to focus on all of those things. You know, what was your stress level like during that period of time? Does that affect how and when you see your family? You know, does your hour drive versus 30 minute drive heavily impact the your relationships in your life? You know, if there's been any uh, significant changes or, or loss, you know, is there depression now? Is there anxiety? Is there a mental right. health issue that we now have to consider, you know, um, in regards to the sleep issues like OSA, like, did you get a new bed? Is it, you know, I don't, I don't know. There's so many things that like go with that, that one small change in a person's life can have just this like ripple effect and right. have an impact on everything else. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I just think we have to be super, super mindful of those things. Um, and then the other part of this equation is, is, is it talks about the distance between. And I think that's really important too, because patients come in with a lot of barriers and a lot of fears and anxieties. Um, you know, sometimes patients have a low dental IQ. They might, may not fully understand how things are connecting between their mouth and their body. Um, maybe it's a past experience that they had and things just you know, maybe they've been to a dentist in the past and they had a really bad experience and now that's their filter for everything. Mm -hmm. So we've got to, in order to really treat our patients effectively, um, we've got to understand, you know, the weight of what they're, they've got going on, but also the distance that they are from us, whether that's, you know, fear wise, whether that's just IQ wise, whether that's, you know, lifestyle, like time wise, if you don't have enough time, you know, their, their time is brief with us. So I think it's just important to really kind of think through all those things and how to really get to the heart of those so that right. we can treat patients as effectively as possible. And essentially it's, you know, filling in the gap, you know, what is the distance? Why is there that chasm and how can we close it? How can yes. we, how can we, you know, make that gap smaller? So like you just mentioned, there are a few different things, like in regards to dental IQ, sometimes, sometimes it's that like head to heart thing too, where people have a lot of head knowledge. They might've heard things about their mouth or their health, and it just hasn't like really hit them or, or maybe, you know, it hasn't moved, moved them to a point where they really like value their, their health that much. And maybe there is like this shift that needs to be made. Like, okay, the person is hearing me, hearing me, hearing me, but maybe they don't understand the value or they're, they're not valuing it, you know? Right. Um, or, you know, I think that a lot of times patients want a coping mechanism, a common coping me mechanism when we receive bad news is just to be in denial too. So do, do we need to close the denial gap? You know, like how can we help patients to feel safe, to express their feelings of, you know, frustration, sadness, anger, even at, at, a, at a loss in the measure of their health? Like how can we close that gap for them? How can we get closer and say, it's okay to feel all those ways and validate those things and, and make it so that they can move through those emotions right. and maybe move forward, you know, with yeah. their treatment plan or, or not be overwhelmed or maybe have that, that, uh, that movement from their head to their heart because they, they've been able to process something. Yeah. Yeah. I think when I think about gravity, like the word grounded comes to mind for me, mm -hmm. like you're grounded, like the gravity is holding you down and you're grounded. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're talking about here is helping patients get really grounded in their dental, their oral care and really helping them understand. And you've got to consider all of those barriers and, and issues to help them really do that. Right. Yeah. So let's move on to the three laws of motion. And these were also, these also belong to Isaac Newton. Um, and they are the principles that govern how the motion of physical objects changes. Um, basically define the fundamental relationship between the acceleration of an object and the forces acting upon it. And I think we're all really familiar with the first rule of motion. And it says an object will remain at rest or in a uniform state of motion unless that state is changed by an external force. So if we're thinking on the hygiene front, um, you know, natural law states that we need external forces to move. 
And this is one of the main reasons that you and I exist here through Bulletproof Hygiene is mm-hmm. because we want to be a, we want to be a catalyst yep. for movement. We want to provide support and motivation for other hygienists and dentists. And you know, we both know it's really, really easy to get stuck um, in a rut and, and in that comfort zone place and not want to step out of that and just kind of, you know, find ourselves, you know, kind of bored in our in our place because we're scared to step out. And if there's not that catalyst or that force that comes along to push us, chances are we're going to find ourselves not feeling that fulfillment and that just bleeds into everything else in life. Right. Um, I just think of, I just think of a, a rock wall when we're talking about this, for some reason, I just got like this mental image of like someone climbing up a rock wall. And you know, when you get to that point where you're like on the, the intermediate wall that you probably shouldn't have started climbing up because you're a total beginner or novice. That's like totally me. I like, like my ego's like, yeah, I can do the advanced wall. No problem. And then I get up like halfway and I'm like, yeah, I'm definitely going to fall. This is definitely (laughs) done for me now. Um, but I just thought of a rock wall of when, like you reach that awkward place where like you've done all you can, and then you're kind of like stuck. And then out of nowhere appears like the, the, rock handle that you have to get to, you know what I mean? And like, I feel like if you're like stuck on that rock wall, this is such a weird analogy. I'm sorry. I don't know. I've been there. uh, Yeah. When you're you're stuck on the rock wall, I feel like we're kind of like providing those little areas of friction so that you can keep propelling forward. You know, we want to be propellers here and we want to provide that friction and that surface area and kind of like something to grab onto and say, Hey, help me pass this really tough point, you know? Um, And for some of us, it's like, it's like a one or two time thing, you know, and and life doesn't go in a straight line, you know, it's, it's a hills and valleys and mountains and all that stuff. But it's, it's good when you're on the rock wall and you're climbing, like to have the, you know, the, first of all, the perspective of someone like standing outside of you stuck on the rock wall saying, Hey, grab onto that one. You know what I mean? They can see like where you need to go next in the big picture, but also sometimes being that being the thing that you hang on to, to get to that next level, you know? So Sharice and I definitely want to be that. And I think that, yeah, just providing that friction and that, that, that small, small piece of help is like, uh, is what relates to me. Yeah. And I think exactly. I relate to this entirely because I have also been on a a climbing, we did like a team thing, um, many years back where we went and did like a climbing day and I found myself stuck in the middle of the wall and I was literally in tears and scared and my muscles were shaking and you know, I was getting ready to like kick off the wall and just, you know, lay down. And, you know, somebody that was down on the ground was yelling up, Hey, you know, right up to your right, you know, see that little crevice right there. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's what we have to be to each other. And obviously I know that's what, what we want to be to hygiene is sometimes it's the person on the ground that has the, the 3000 foot view that can see more than you can see. Cause you're stuck in that one place mm-hmm. that for, for them to just give you a little bit of direction or a little bit of support or, Hey, you got this, you can do this. Hang on. You're almost there. You know, I yeah. think that's super, super important. Yeah. So I, so I think that that's one way, you know, that, that we can support each other. Like when someone's struggling and they're going up the hill, they're climbing the mountain, you know, that's a really, really tough place. But I think there are other instances when someone's just reminds me, I, I don't know where all these similes are coming from today, but like, I'm thinking of like a bowling ball, you know, as it, as it goes down the, um, like the gutter, like yeah, you, yeah, the yeah. gutter ball, yeah. like it sometimes will like crap out right before it even makes it to the end where it's supposed to like go back and be reprocessed or whatever. And it's right? just like the worst thing ever. Like, you're like, Oh great. Now I can't like bowl again. Now I go like, wait, I have to call the person and whatever. I feel like sometimes we just lose our momentum and without someone to come alongside us and kind of like put their arm around us and say, Hey, let's keep going. You got this. Like, let's just make it into, even if it's a gutter ball, like, come on, just let's go. And we'll, and then we'll bowl again and we'll do better. You know, yeah. next time I feel like I definitely need someone to come put their arm around me to help me keep propelling forward. Even if I'm not really in a difficult place, sometimes it's just that, that lull, you know, the yeah. repetition and the routine and all the good things are kind of like keeping me in the same place, maybe comfort zone, but that's not, um, that's not living to the best of our potential. And it's not fulfilling, you know, that's not when we're the happiest We're really the happiest when people, when we are in it with people who are moving forward and wanting to grow and enjoying the journey and, and just put their arm around us and help us to keep moving forward. Yeah. Well, and I think an important point I want to make about forces is, you know, it, we can perceive things in very different ways. So if it's going to take a force to get us out of a, a stuck position, you know, sometimes it really depends on how we view those because we can view those as positive or negative, right? Um, and, you know, sometimes someone might be, really attempting to support us in a positive way, but because maybe we're not in the best place, it comes off as negative, 
or vice versa. I mean, sometimes right. people don't necessarily know how to help and maybe mm-hmm. their, their motivation is, it does feel more negative or stressful. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it's, it's important to, if we kind of feel those pushes, if we feel that, that tension to kind of stop and check in with ourselves of, Hey, like this feels uncomfortable. It's either like, it's too much or it's, it's, you know, it's positive or it's negative, but to stop and ask, like, I'm feeling something here. How should I respond to this? You know, something, I feel like something needs to change. Right. And I think, you know, what's, what's interesting is like in a work environment, it's, it's different than like our personal lives where in our personal lives, it's like, we can choose to be around whoever we want. There's not necessarily a goal for hanging out. You know what I mean? Like we don't, ha- it, there's a lot more like freedom kind of in that. But I think at, at work, we have like specific responsibilities. So we do need to hold each other accountable to what we're doing. But I think the healthiest way, honestly, to get the help that you need is to ask for exactly what you need, you know? Right. And that right. can be the hardest part. So sometimes, you know, if a person doesn't ask me, but but they seem maybe from the outside looking in to be struggling with something, I, I ask them like, Hey, would you like my help? Would would you be okay with me offering a suggestion? You know, but it's a question. I I don't just go start like, uh, you know, giving unsolicited advice because one that's, if they're not ready to hear it, then, then we're both wasting our time. You know, I'm wasting my time by sharing whatever advice or insight that I have. And, and I'm wasting their time because they're not growing from it, you know? So, So we're wasting everyone's time. So it's a good thing. I think it's good practice too. If you see someone who's struggling at work and especially if you're not in a, in a position where you're their, their leader or their boss or their whatever, I think that's a different um, dynamic where if, if I'm their boss, I have to do that. You know, I have to make sure that you're reaching your potential and you're, re- you know, setting goals and keeping you on track. Like that's my job to do that for you. But if you're, you know, colleagues, you're just looking at your colleague, kind of your equal at work and you're seeing them struggle. There's still like an appropriate space to be like, Hey, like I- I'm noticing this. Are you open to some feedback? Are you open to some right. constructive criticism or can I help you in some way? But then, you know, if that's the case, we've got to be open to the fact that the answer could be no. Right. You know, like, right. no, I'm not ready. And then that's kind of a gift too, because then, like I said, no one's wasting their time. No one's getting right. something that they don't want. There aren't going to be any uh, hard feelings, feelings of judgment, anything. So, I mean, it's just good to ask. I think it's good yeah. practice. And I think one way to do that too, is if you see somebody who, who you just can kind of tell they're not in the best of places, or maybe there's something that the practice is trying to do and they haven't really hopped in on it yet. And, you know, you kind of see that, you notice that like, Sometimes I think just coming across and like sharing your own experience and your own story and like Mm -hmm. some excitement you've had with it and sharing that to help them realize, Hey, like, I'm really excited about this. And I don't know if you've experienced this, but if you ever need help, I'd love to help you with it. And, you know, sometimes I just think that is it that, you know, it's almost in that attractive force of like, Ooh, that's cool. I would like, I want to have fun like that. I want to do that. Yeah. Sometimes that's a great way to broach something instead of kind of you know, sticking your head and being like, are you okay? You don't seem like yourself. It could just yeah. be like, Hey, I had a great day today. I had this, you know, whatever it is that I was able to do. And I want to share it with you. And, you know, it was just really cool. Yeah. 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 All right. So let's go to the second rule of motion, which states that force is equal to the change in momentum over time. So in other words, that means the rate of change is directly proportional to the amount of force applied. So if we're talking about being at the top of our game in the hygiene world, um, we know we've got to grow and move forward because stagnation is not, you know, where we want to live. That's not fun. Um, So we've got to ask ourselves some hard questions like what forces are we allowing in? Are we feeling anything, you know, that the is pushing us towards movement. Mm -hmm. Um, Are we seeking or avoiding being our best selves? Because I think that's a realistic question. Um, And are we allowing enough force to actually create change? Those are quality questions. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that, well, that has a lot to do with, you know, those are deep questions to ask ourselves, you know, like that has a lot to do with that inner monologue of like, you know, and I think that the, the, one of the last questions that you asked about, am I allowing, um, or seeking success or change? What, what, how did you put that again? 
I said, yeah, what forces are we allowing in? Are we seeking or avoiding being our best selves? Right. And so I think what people don't think about sometimes is that sometimes we're sabotaging ourselves on the down low from being our best selves. You know, I think that there's a fear of not being good enough and not being our best, but then there's also a fear of being our best, because I think there are other things that come along with that, like the the fear of being my best and that still not be, being good enough or being yeah. my best, meaning that I'm trying as hard as I possibly can and someone's still judging me. Right. Like, oh my God, I, I'm being like who I actually am and that person's being judged or that person's being frowned upon or being told that that's still not good enough or or I don't like it or whatever, you know? So, so it's a huge risk, you know, ch- choosing to become yourself. Um, it's a risk because it requires a lot of work and planning and it, and it really hurts and sucks sometimes when you put in the work and then someone just like shits all over you kind of thing. But I think in that sense, like overcoming that fear of being successful or being your best self, I think that if, if our come froms are really strongly like, this is my vision. These are my goals for life. Despite what anyone else is doing, this is what I, this is the legacy that I want to leave behind. This is the way that I want to impact the world. Um, it's been easier for me to accept, like, I want to step into being my best self, even though it's a huge risk, you know, it's, it's been, it's made it easier for me to be my authentic self and, um, kind of lose the, the fear and some of the care of what are other people going to think? And what if they judge me? What if this is humiliating? What if I fail? What if whatever, because I'm like, I'm just looking at what I want to leave. I'm looking at the end goal and it takes the pressure off of me, you know, and, and it always goes back to perfect. Isn't real or relatable. It's not attainable. It's not a real thing, you know? So I think that if we go back to that, we can pretty, pretty easily overcome that. And we're our, our most limiting people right. in our lives, you know, we're, we're our self-limiting, limiting, uh, forces. So yeah, well, I think I, that's an important thing to yeah. consider. And I think too, so if we're talking about, you know, my, I like the part where it says, you know, the rate of change is directly proportional to the amount of force applied. So say I'm seeking change, you know, for example, we got a new Itero scanner um, at the end of last year. And at first that felt a little uncomfortable to me because it's brand new. I've never used it before. It's new technology. Um, I want to do it right. Um, I I don't want to look like an idiot in front of my patient. You know, I don't want it to take 15 minutes to scan their mouth. They're going to get super irritated by that. Um, So I spent a lot of time and that's kind of the the question is, you know, proportional to the amount of force applied. If you're wanting to incorporate something new or change something that you're doing, Mm -hmm. it is going to take some force. It is going to take some movement. And so, you know, I spent a lot of time practicing on coworkers and I took a couple of courses and asked a lot of questions and really got comfortable with it. And I think anytime we're wanting to achieve any kind of change, whether it's something you know, clinical like that, um, or if it's, you know, changing your system or your verbiage or anything that you're doing, it it does need to take enough force to really create that change. Because I think a lot of times what happens is we try something new and we're not good at it right away. So we kind of are like, oh yeah, I'm not going to do that. And we miss out on what could have been. Well, there are different forces at play too. That's the thing. Like there's the force in the direction that you want to go or the, in in, uh, achieving the thing. And then there are forces maybe that come against us sometimes like the negativity and and the self-talk negativity from others. So I had a recent experience with one of our hygienists. Um, We uh, implement iTero scanning in our, in our office and we do 3d, 3d wellness scans, which means um, alternating with bite wing visits. We do a 3d wellness scan, which is an iTero scan just to track tooth movement, tooth wear kind of review with the patient, some of the changes that have been happening. So we implemented that in all our new patient appointments uh, last year, like toward the middle of last year. And then we had, um, very specific by win goals for when each of the hygienists was going to be proficient at that and have that worked into their schedule. And, um, we each agreed on different dates, but it, they were all set for be- before the end of last year. So unbeknownst to me, um, I get with my hygiene assistant, my hygiene assistant has a bird's eye view on what's going on. It's difficult for me to have that bird's eye view because I'm running my own schedule all day. You know, like I've got my own column kind of thing. We, I work in a big office with 18 operatories. It's easy for me not to see kind of what's going on from her perspective. So I teamed up with her and just said, Hey, how's it going with, with, you know, the scanning and what's going on? How are the hygienists doing? And she just, you know, explained to me, everyone's doing great. There's, there's one hygienist who I think is very hesitant to start you know, scanning and she's having some barriers and having some problems. And, um, I've been doing most of her scans and I said, huh, that's interesting. Um, so I got with that particular person and I said, Hey, um, you know, I, am just curious, how's it going with the scanning? She said, not very good. I said, are you doing your own scans? 
Uh, no, I'm not. Okay. Um, remember when we, you know, set the buy win, you know, it was back in December, I believe. And you, you had a goal to do X number of scans each day and you were going to be under 10 minutes and, you know, these specific like parts of your goal. She said, yes, I remember. Um, and then I said, okay, well, well now at this point it's, you know, you're the only person who's not scanning like, and I don't say that at all, like to, because I'm shaming you or want to make you feel bad. It's just, right. this is the, the expectation that we have. This is the standard that we have here. You're not up to standard at this point. So moving forward, it's actually going to be sink or swim. And I said, so starting tomorrow, you know, you can't use an assistant. You can't, you're not going to have someone else come in and do your scan for you. Um, you're fully responsible for completing whichever scans you need to complete, whether it's a 3D wellness scan, a Perrier Protect scan, an Invisalign scan. And if you can't work it out, you know, in your schedule that day, then you're going to be responsible for rescheduling that patient and scanning them a different day, you know, because, it, and it's just like, I think this has to be very person specific because this person, one is very open to constructive criticism, like really, really good, really good hygienist. Um, but this was a great conversation to have with her because it opened my eyes to a couple of things from her perspective, you know? So she shared with me that there was an instance where um, when we set our goal initially, she was doing a scan on a patient after having, you know, et been educated about how the scanner works and had courses and classes that practiced on team members and was at a place where she could start scanning on patients. You know, she was slow. It wasn't going very quickly, but uh, she, it was good and safe and she was doing a good job. Um, she uh, was scanning a, a difficult mouth, I guess, with lots of recession and crowding and, and just tricky. It was a tricky mouth and someone jumped into the room and apparently said something to her that was that she perceived was demeaning. You know, they were like, oh, that's, that scan is terrible. And, and it was unprofessional. It was a moment that shouldn't have happened. And someone really embarrassed her. She felt really embarrassed in that instance in front of the patient. And she felt like it wasn't good enough and she didn't do a good job. And she said that was the turning point for her when she just quit. She stopped scanning. There was that, that traumatic, you know, to her instance that happened. And she was like, honestly, that is what it was. And I just have never taken the time to think about it. So it, it created this opportunity for her to look at it and say like, huh, what's my holdup? Like, what's my hang up here? Like, you're right. Like, why, why am I not scanning? And, you know, thankfully at Spodak now, like I have such a good relationship with my hygienist because we have a lot of history together. Right. So they know that I'm like, not trying to be an a-hole. Right. Like when we're bringing this up, we know we're having like a, a human conversation. We know that I'm open to their constructive criticism too. It goes both ways, you know, and I do their quarterly reviews where we talk about a lot of things and sensitive subjects. And we talk about them like adults and without emotions and that sort of thing. So this is a, you know, it sounds like the conversation went really well, but it's because of all the history, right. you know? Right. But I think that that's the friction that we need sometimes for someone to say, well, sink or swim now, right. I'm going to check right. in with you at the end of the day, every single day. And that's our agreement is I'm checking in on this person at the end of every day saying, Hey, how are your scans? Did anyone else scan for you today? No. Okay, great. Are there any questions that you need to ask me? What do you need moving forward as support? And I also let her know, you know, my expectations are never for you to scan perfectly. Right. Because every mouth is different. We all need help with different things. Like even I, like sometimes I'll step out and be like, Hey, Tamika, can you grab the, the, you know, the, the distal of this third molar? I really can't get it no matter what I'm doing. And can I watch you do it? So maybe that I can learn, you know? So I told her, I do not expect perfection. Right. I, I need, these are our standards. You need to be under 10 minutes. You need to be filling in all the blues, but if you need to grab someone for a hand once in a while, that's okay. Like I'm there too. You know, we're all humans. It's all good. And she was like, you know, thank you so much. Appreciate that. I checked in with her the first uh, day or two. And she said she was scanning and how it went. She told me the time and it's just, she, she feels empowered yes, because awesome. she got that, the, the necessary friction right. and now she's moving forward and feels like she's overcome this huge obstacle, you know? That's awesome. And that's such a good example. That's a ex great example all around of having a negative force that kind of kept her stuck. And then a positive force coming behind her to say, Hey, you can do this. You're mm -hmm. going to do this. We can make this happen. Like that's, that's perfect. Thanks for sharing that. Mm-hmm. So I'd say let's move to our third rule of motion. And also this, I think is very familiar to most of us. And this is for every action in nature, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And so obviously we're coming in our operatories every day with expectations of us producing results based off of our actions. And so I think where I wanna apply this for when we think about hygiene is just really having a self-awareness of what vibe we're putting out there for our patients. Um, you know, how are we using our time and our verbiage and our body language and what reaction are we seeking or are we just kind of going through the motions without even thinking about it? Like, are we 
I mean, I, there's days I can think back to where I was just kind of doing my thing. Like, Hey, I have eight patients on my schedule today and I got to get in and get them in and get them out. And you kind of lose sight of sometimes, like, I think we have to be super, super present in every single appointment to really help our patients be as healthy as possible. And sometimes our mindset can like drift into, well, like I'm just here to clean teeth today instead of like, Hey, I'm really here to help my patients be as healthy as they can be. And so I wanted to just talk a little bit about that. You know, like if we're for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Like what actions are you taking throughout your day? If you're not getting the, um, you know, the enrollment that you're looking for, the responses that you're looking for, or the, you know, the, the, the results from your periotherapy that you're looking for, whatever that is, if you're not getting what you're looking for, it's time to kind of take a step back and say, well, what am I doing to, to get to these? And, you know, is it something that I've just gotten lazy about and haven't been doing, or do I need some coaching from someone else? Like, what is it that's keeping me from getting where I want and need to be? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that, uh, we tend to think of this rule as like karma, like what you put out in the universe will come back to you kind of thing. Like the energy that you're putting out is what you're going to attract. And I think that too, but I don't think necessarily that what you're putting out is necessarily going to mirror image, you know, the way that you put it out or who you put it out to kind of, I think sometimes, um, the, uh, equal and opposite reaction comes in a way that is unexpected or something has an impact on something else that seems unrelated, but it actually is like in a covert way kind of related. It's kind of like, uh, I'll give an example, like, um, you know, getting, going to sleep earlier um, impacts waking up, up on time most likely, but the, you know, all the trickle effects of that is like, I'm able to come to work and acclimate for the day and, and prepare. And then I'm not running behind all day. So I didn't think that going to bed earlier would, would connect directly to me, not running behind with my patients all day. Like, I didn't think about that effect. Like I may have just been trying to get more sleep. Like maybe I'm, I'm tired. I'm trying to make a healthy change for myself, but it's been interesting for me. Um, how, when you do something with a certain intent or energy, um, especially a positive thing, how that positive thing, a lot of times has this equal and opposite reaction in this way that you didn't expect. Right. You know? Right. Well, and I think, you know, just thinking in our operatories all day, like say you presented, you know, treatment throughout the day and, and, you know, say you presented five to five different patients and maybe four of them said no. And you, it's worth the time to kind of sit back and go like, Hmm, if I'm consistently getting no's, it might be time to change the actions that I'm taking. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's my approach or the way that I'm educating. Um, and, and on the converse, if you've got some things that are really working well for you, like really kind of sharing that with others around you, um, you know, that's the benefit of being on a team is getting to share what's working, but really kind of making that your new norm. So I think it's just really, you know, we have to be so intentional with everything that we're doing. I mean, we, we are holding people's health and wellness and, and their ability to get there in our hands. So we've got to be super intentional about that. And if we, if we're dragging in with the mindset of just slinging profi paste, um, then, you know, we're not going to get them there. So I think it's just, we got to be mindful. All right. We're going to make a shift here. So we, we took, we took a look at the, um, motion principles, but now we're going to switch over. And this is, uh, these are called the Gestalt principles of visual perceptions. And these were developed by a group of German scientists way back in the 1920s. Um, and they, they're super interesting to me because they're really focused on how people interpret the world and our perceptions. And I am a big, big believer, um, that perception is what it's all about. It's the, the game we're playing in our own minds um, and, and how we approach the world and how we approach hygiene is, is, comes from what we're playing in our heads. Um, but these principles talk about that the human brain is wired to see structure, logic, and patterns. And these principles detail how our brains create structure by default. So we tend to order our experiences in a manner that is regular, orderly, and recognizable. So the first one is called the figure ground principle, and it states that people instinctively perceive objects as either being in the foreground or the background. And this occurs quickly and subconsciously in most cases. Um, so this, this kind of psychology kind of stuff just gets me. I'm like super excited by it. Yeah, me too. So
So when we think about this kind of concept that people instinctively perceive object as either being in the foreground or the background, and, and let me say this, that these particular principles literally are like what we visually perceive. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a whole lot of what we visually perceive that goes inward to our brain and how we kind of think things through. Mm -hmm. So if we are naturally seeing certain things that stand out to us in the foreground and we naturally put some other things in the background, um, you know, for hygiene, I think there's a huge part. I feel like a lot of patients don't connect that their oral health has a direct connection to their overall health, that I feel like patients are more apt to put their overall health in the, you know, the forefront, and they think that's what's most important. And mm -hmm. then in the background is, you know, yeah, you know, I get my teeth clean once a year and it, and it kind of, you know, there's that, that space in between that disconnect almost. Um, and I think a lot of patients have that same thing between like the hygienist and the dentist, you know, like, you know, that we're kind of in the background and, you know, what, we're just here to clean your teeth. Um, and so I think we have to ask ourselves, you know, are we coming across confidently to be able to help our patients understand that, you know, what we do is vital to their total health and helping them make those connections and helping them bring that more to the forefront of their mind. You know, are we putting their own health in the forefront? Mm -hmm. If they're leaving thinking, oh, I, you know, I'll see in six months, I just need to get polished again. Like we're probably not doing our jobs to help them really understand that, hey, you know, I'm, I'm serving as a prevention specialist for you. Mm -hmm. You know, we're either treating active disease or we're preventing it. And that's a big, big deal because with all we know about all the connections between, you know, oral health and systemic health at this point, like this is a really, really important part of you, of your long-term health and prevention. Right. So it's, so it's translating our role and their perception of our role of dental and oral health kind of thing. Right. Yeah. That goes back to us as like, um, vital educators, you know, like, I think that even for a, even for a profi patient, like they should understand, like there's a spectrum of health. You're on the spectrum of health and you are, you have a healthy mouth right now. That's great. You know, um, the things that we can do to, to keep it healthy are X, Y, and Z, you know, if ever we cross a bridge and things aren't going so well, then we'll chat about it at that time. But it's important for people to know that, um, everything, things can change, you know, and that we are assessing and evaluating and what we're assessing for and why that's important to them and how it affects the rest of their body, you know? Um, and I think of, uh, it's, you know, I think of a lot of times when patients come in and they say, oh, I've never had uh, those numbers done before, or, oh, no one's ever checked me for oral cancer. And, and my thought is like, it's possible that that's true. But a lot of times I think no one's explained to them what they're doing while right. they're doing it. Right. So it's like, even just explaining what you're doing to, to a healthy mouth patient or to any yes. patient, like yes. helps them to understand like, oh, this is how it disconnects and, and right. it helps them to connect the dots. Like, oh, you're checking the health of my gum and bone to make sure that, you know, my teeth aren't about to become loose, that they're not going to lose anything, that there isn't any active infection. You know, when you use those words and that's clear, like then, then it, it may change from the background to the foreground to the patient slowly over time. You know, yes. um, I had an experience the other day where I had a, a very young patient who was, um, who had a congenital heart condition, you know, since she was born clearly. Um, and it was like a risk worth is worth, um, I'm sorry, a risk versus benefits situation of having surgery to correct it versus leaving it and kind of living with it. Um, and both things, you know, had risk and, and finally the risks of leaving her issue versus having surgery to repair the issue outweighs it, you know? So having surgery is less risky right now than just continuing to live the way that she is. So she's about to have heart surgery. And thankfully I was so relieved. And so like, obviously not happy about her situation, but very thankful to her surgeon who said, Hey, the number one thing that's going to undermine this for you is if you, you you have periodontal disease and if your mouth health isn't good because it's a systemic issue and all the studies that we're finding are, this is what impacts how stable this is going to be, how you're going to recover from surgery, how we're going to move forward in the future. So that surgeon sent her to me and we just did localized, um, perio therapy and, um, and, and got her perio disease stable before she goes in for surgery, you know, so that person, she understands, I think that this isn't just in the periphery. This is a, a foreground type of thing for right. her. And this, this comes like almost before her heart, like not, right. not before right. like this kind of thing, because right. it, it's not necessarily a fire that needs to be put out. Like this isn't a, she's not in pain, you know, nothing's right. about to swell up and cause her, you know, a serious issue, but in the long term, it's, it, it will definitely secondarily cause her a big problem with her heart health. Yeah. Yeah. Great example. Mm -hmm. 
So next we have the similarity principle. And this states that when things appear to be similar to each other, we group them together and tend to think they have the same function. So, you know, again, we're talking about perception is everything. And so this to me is where our team culture and collaboration come into play. Um, you know, patients come in with a lot of filters already of, you know, what they think about dentistry and, you know, you know, whether or not they want to be there and what they've, what their past experiences have been. And they tend to filter everything through that. Um, and, and for them, you know, say you've had a patient who had a really bad experience when they come, I, I had a patient this last week as a new patient, she was literally like physically shaking just as we were talking through the medical history, because she was so scared to be there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I asked her, I said, well, tell me, you know, obviously I don't want to drudge through it all, but tell me a little bit about your previous experiences, just so I understand where you're coming from. And, you know, she went on to share, but, and you could tell, obviously she felt we were safe enough to come in the door and sit in the chair, but she was still very, very afraid. Mm -hmm. And I think patients tend to, you know, this, this, is you know that when we when things appear to be similar to each other, we group them together and think they have the same function. So if they're come from is that dentistry is scary and it's going to hurt me and be painful, then any dental office looks that way to them. And so we have that responsibility when patients are coming in to understand those filters and understand where they're coming from. I mean, if you don't have that question on your medical history, that's such a great question to ask is, you know, our question, we phrase it, have you had any unfavorable dental visits in the past? Mm -hmm. um, that's a great way to get them talking and understand where they're coming from. Um, because, you know, they, they do kind of group dentists together. And, yeah. and so we've got to, we've got to, uh, you know, I know you and I both that our practices have a great way of introducing patients to our practice and what their expectations are and, you know, what our, our ideology is and what our come from is so that we introduce up front. Yeah. Um, but I just think, you know, if, if we appear similar to each other, then when we think about team culture, we have to think about that because does your team look the same? Are they on the same page? Is everybody working together and doing the same thing? Because, you know, we can, we can all wear the same scrubs, but we may not all have the same mission in mind. Right. I think that's really, really important. Yeah. And in, in regards to, um, you know, the, the patient who's coming in with that, it sounds like that patient had severe, you know, crippling anxiety. I think some of the power of just asking that question, like, have you had any negative past dental experiences and like just giving them an opportunity to talk about it in a setting without being judgmental and without, you know, finding fault or blame on anyone, even the past provider, you know, like it's not about blaming anyone else for what happened. We weren't there, you know, we don't know who and what and how and whatever, but I think sometimes just hearing it, giving them, giving them this opportunity to talk about it, making sure that we're not repeating history because clearly that was truly traumatic for that person, right. whatever happened to them, right. you know, and we've got to remember too, that, that sometimes, um, there are instances, especially in someone's childhood or when they've, when they've experienced like a severely traumatic event, I think of like PTSD, um, and you know, someone maybe coming back from a, a war or something and hearing a lot of gunshots and then, you know, a, a car backfires when they're back in the real world. And then they have a reaction as though it's a gunshot, you know, it's, that's a trigger instance. And, and for some of us it's well, and what a trigger is, is just like, you have this physiological reaction. The rest of your brain is reacting before your frontal yep. lobe is reacting where we have all of the ability to be logical and rational. You know, it, it's like your body and your physiology is responding before your brain and your rational thinking and your critical thinking right. is, you know? And so, so I think that it, that's important to remember. Sometimes people walk into the dentist, have this emotional response and they're like, I know that nothing bad is going to happen. Like, I know it's going to be okay, but they're having this physiological response. And I think that honestly, like they're, it's just a trigger for them. We can't always change the trigger or that automatic response. It may be something that they're going to, you know, struggle with their whole life, but we can at least be lend an ear in a non-judgmental, um, you know, be a non-judgmental person for them who helps them to feel safer about it, you know, and work with, work with them in that state right. and just say, Hey, I want to make you as comfortable as possible. Like how, how can we do that together? Like talk to me and let's have a conversation and, 
and, and just, you know, sometimes I think talking about that past experience really helps people because like I said, they haven't been heard or maybe they've tried to talk about it, but they weren't validated. Like no one said, wow, that really sucks. Like, I'm sorry. Right. A lot of times people are like, oh, they didn't mean to do that. I'm sure it was fine. I'm sure it wasn't as big a deal as you think when you minimize you're, you're not an, you're not allowing that person to like feel that and like work through it, you know? So I think it, it's important when people try and have that conversation with us, it's a really high quality question. Like, have you had any past uh, bad dental experiences? Let's talk about that. What can we do to make you more comfortable? I want to make sure that we don't, you know, repeat history and we want to take the very best care of you. So what does that look like to you? Yeah. It's important. We, also, we also have the question, um, rank yourself one to 10 for your fear or anxiety level to be here. Mm -hmm. um, and anytime I have a patient who's, you know, five or above, you know, I tell them at the top of the appointment, you know, I see that you rated yourself a little high. Let's, I want to talk about, I want to understand that, but I need you to know that you are in control while you were here. So if we're saying or doing something that's not working for you, you put your hands up, we'll find a different way. Right. Um, that's really important to me because if you can give that patient control, that is going to ease their anxiety more than anything else. It's all of the unknowns that they're, they're unsure of and, and what's happened to them in the past. So they, they need that piece of control. So that's such a great way to do that. Right. And if on the front end, you know, we've heard what the problem was and what caused them trauma, even if it's something like I couldn't get numb and then I, yeah. you know, was, yeah. the, was being drilled on or something yeah. like okay, we're, we're not going to do that. Like no matter what, if you're not numb, we're, we're rescheduling, we'll, we'll give adequate time for this appointment to make sure that you're always comfortable. You have my word that that's not going to happen again, or, or, you know, like my gums just hurt so much. And then right from the beginning, you know, letting the person know, like, that's really important to me to make sure that you are comfortable during this whole appointment. I have different, um, things that I can use. I have, I have numbing gel. I have, um, uh, tooth desensitizer. I have uh, local anesthetic. If, if that's what works best for you, I have nitrous, you know, I'll make sure that you're physically comfortable throughout the appointment and we'll keep this open dialogue going. I tell them we're going to continue communicating yes. throughout the appointment yes. so that we can make little adjustments as needed. And I tell them, I don't want you to, to grin and bear and sit there in pain and not tell me. I'm like, I want you to, to tell me like, how can, how can we make right. this more comfortable for you? Right. Because it's my pleasure to do that. I want to do that for yeah. you. Yeah. So we have um, one more of the Gestalt principles, and this is the proximity principle. And this states that things that are close together appear to be more related than things that are spaced further apart. And I think this is so applicable in our hygiene team culture. You know, to ask our question, is our team on the same page? Is everybody practicing at the same level? Um, does everybody embrace the same mission? Um, and know where we're going here. Um, do your patients feel, I think this is a really good question. Do you think your patients feel your team tension or do they feel more cared for because there's team unity? Right. I mean, we've all been in situations where there was tension between people and you could feel that and it was uncomfortable. And we sometimes I think fall into, we kind of forget that that's a thing. Um, you know, and if our team isn't, you know, fully united and on the same front, if, if patients are viewing us as separated and far apart, um, then that, you know, can put them at a, a place of uncertainty or, you know, ill ease for what they're coming in for. So I think it's so, so important. You know, I know that you and I are both the biggest champions of having healthy team culture, but it really, really is important, not just for, not just for those of us who are part of the team and want to come in and, and have a great experience and a great, you know, environment to work in, but especially for our patients because they sense it and they feel it. Right. And, you know, it's interesting that this proximity principle states uh, that things that are close together appear to be more related than things that are spaced further apart, um, because I think that they not only appear to be more related or more alike than things that are further apart, but it's kind of like, you know, the friendship rule, the friendship principle, you know, if you have five friends that you spend the most time with, like you're going to be a concoction and of basically your five closest friends, the people that you spend the most time with, you know? So at work, it's just interesting because whether a culture is, you know, kind of crappy and toxic and dramatic and whatever, like we're all going to become like more like that until there's intentional uh, effort put into going in the opposite direction. You know, so if we are um, taking the time to design our culture to be empowering, uplifting um, in order to move forward, in order to grow, enabling that sort of thing and enabling open conversations, you know, where we're not shut down, we're not overly emotional, we're kind of looking at this stuff as objectively as possible, we're going to get more and more of that, you know, but, but it's got to be intentional because I think that the things that come the easiest are, are the, you know, gossip doesn't take very much effort. 
it's, right. it's a lot more, it's a lot easier to just like talk to the person who um, isn't directly involved in the situation than to talk to the person who is, because that's awkward and it's right. hard and it's uncomfortable right. for us, you know? Right. Um, so that's just interesting. I think that the, the truth of the proximity principle is that things that are close together, not only appear to be more related than things that are spaced apart, but they are actually more related and they are more alike than things right. that are, are further apart. So let's make sure that in regards to um, culture and team unity that we, we are intentionally uh, being better about what are, what we're, how, which ways for rubbing off on each other. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to kind of wrap this up with one last concept, and this isn't necessarily as much of a, a rule or a law as it, is, as it is as it is just a concept, but it's the concept of potential energy. And it says that an object can store energy as a result of its position. Um, then this stored energy of position is referred to as potential energy. So example, if you have a bow and arrow, if you just hold the bow by itself, it, it doesn't have any potential for energy. But if you draw that bow back because of the position it's in, it now has a large potential energy. And I think, you know, in light of everything we are hoping to do with Bulletproof Hygiene, you know, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't ask, you know, are you in a position to learn and grow? What is your potential energy as a hygienist? Are you poised? Are you positioned to grow and thrive, in, you know, in your practice and in your profession and for your patients? Um, and do you have the training you need? Do you feel confident in your skills? I mean, I think, you know, we all have such amazing potential when you consider, you know, the, the people that we get to interact and touch all day. And so I think it's really, really important to ask yourself, you know, what do I have? Where, where do I feel powerful? What do I need help in? Where can I grow? And yeah, I think absolutely. that's exactly why we are here as Bulletproof Hygiene. Absolutely. So. And this, this podcast uh, was Sharisa's idea. Sharisa, you pulled this off like <laughs> without a hitch. I was like physics in high. I was like, how are we going to do? Oh, okay. <laughs> that really, really makes sense. Like this all resonated me big time. So the, the physics topic got me a little uh, nervous and sweaty, um, but, I, but I'm glad it, it worked out and it was definitely relevant for me. So thanks for coming up with such a great topic and thanks for leading the way. Cause I was definitely, definitely going to be lost in this one. If I was, uh, if I was, well, and the good news is there is no test at the end. We made it. Thank the Lord. <laughs> I would not pass. I might pass after that, after that, uh, that, that great overview that you just mm -hmm. gave us. So all of that to be said, um, we are here to champion, champion you guys. Um, and if you haven't checked us out yet, come check us out on our Mighty Networks app, um, Bulletproof Hygiene. Um, that is such a great place. We've had so many hygienists already reach out, asking us a lot of questions. We've had some good conversation already. So if you're feeling, you know, hey, I, I need some, I need some encouragement. I need some forces, you know, from the outside in. I, I need some more potential here. Please, please, please join up with us. Come talk to us. Um, you know, comment on our, on our podcast. We want to know what you want to hear more of or where you need some help. Yep. And please remember to, you know, we've got the live summit coming in July. If you are interested in that, go to bulletproofsummit.com to get more information about the courses that are being offered, the tracks that are offered, what it's going to look like for hygienists who want to come. Um, if your dentist wants to know kind of what the value is for that and why you should come, um, please feel free to go to bulletproofsummit.com or reach out to us on Mighty Network, reach out to us on Instagram. We just can't wait to uh, see you guys face to face in July and really crush it and get ready for the future with you. Thanks so much for being here today. Thanks so much for listening. We will talk to you next time. Bye-bye.